the Imperial Japanese Mission 1917, a record of the reception throughout the United States of the special mission headed by Viscount Ishii. And when the Imperial Japanese Mission was uh, in New York City, they had a dinner and some pretty famous people spoke at this dinner. One of them was John Dewey. John Dewey is the father of our failing, disastrous public education system. Here's what he said. Listen very carefully. John Dewey, professor of philosophy in Columbia University, who was the next speaker, was listened to with great intentness. He said, quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. Unquote. Now, bear in mind, folks, that's 1917. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, I think, dude. that had been so much of my life. I went into the Air Force. I was in the Strategic Air Command for four years uh, as an aircraft and missile hydraulic technician, which is, uh, I worked on the, uh, the uh, pneumatic and hydraulic systems of B-52 bombers, KC-135 aircraft, and Minuteman missiles. I had a secret security clearance. Uh, that's where I saw my first atomic bomb. I mean, we worked around in these planes uh, especially the ones on the uh, alert pad were always loaded, ready to go drop these bombs at a moment's notice. But while I was in the Air Force, I met uh, sergeants, men who were older than me, and had been in the Air Force for quite a while, told me that they had participated in projects that had recovered crashed extraterrestrial craft, what you call UFOs. And... Uh, they never told these stories unless they had quite a bit to drink. So I never really believed it. I thought, well, these guys are running a scam on me. You know, even though I'd heard about these things when I was a kid, uh, I just still didn't believe it. It's just so far out in left field, it's not something that you really give any serious thought to until something personal happens, which came later. While I left the Air Force, I went into the Navy which is really where I wanted to be in the first place. I'd always had this tremendous uh, feeling and connection with the, with the ocean. I was an excellent swimmer. Um, but I had a problem as a, as a child. I, was, I had chronic motion sickness. If I got in a car and we went on a long trip, I got deathly ill. And same with boats or anything. I couldn't ride on the things at the carnival that went around and around uh, because it just made me tremendously ill. But I decided after I had uh, gone through the Air Force experience that, uh, sick or not, you know, I was going to go in the Navy because that's really what I had wanted to do. So I did. Volunteered for submarine duty um, and was assigned to the USS Tyru SS-416, which was a diesel-electric boat, World War II type, that had been reconfigured. Uh, when I went on board the, the boat, it was in the dry dock at Pearl Harbor, 
Naval Shipyard and had literally been cut in half. They put in a 12-foot sonar section and then three domes on the deck for triangulating targets using sonar. Um, and this was really one of the, um, the most up-to-date electronically submarines that we had. Um, it wasn't a nuclear submarine, but uh, as, as far as the ability to approach, get close to a target and destroy it, um, it, it had a better capacity to do that than any other boat that we had. Um, while we were on a transit from the Portland, Seattle area on the surface, I actually saw, I was the port lookout, uh, and I saw the most incredible thing that I think I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and, it, and it had such a profound effect upon my view of the universe and the world that we live in. Um, that I wish everybody could experience this. I saw come up out of the ocean, from beneath the surface of the sea, a huge disc-shaped craft about the size of a Midway-class aircraft carrier, which is tremendous in size. Uh, even though that's one of our smallest carriers there was then, um, it's still a huge, tremendously big object. came up out of the ocean and rose into the air and tumbled on its axis and went up into the clouds, and I was awestruck, dumbstruck, and uh, I mean dumbstruck, literally, I could not utter a sound. Uh, and my first um, impulse was to tell the officer of the deck that I'd seen a flying saucer, and then luckily for me, I couldn't talk, uh, because on second thought, that's not what I really wanted to say, uh, because I didn't want to be the only Looney Tunes character on a submarine with a tight-knit crew that you had to live close, in close quarters with, uh, uh, because that's... Uh, that's a hell of a way to live. So I told the officer deck that I'd seen something about 15 degrees off the port bow at a relative distance of about two and a half nautical miles. And uh, uh, he began to look in that area. And the starboard lookout had heard me tell him this, and he began to look over there. And while we were all three watching, uh, either the same craft or another one exactly like it came down out of the clouds, tumbled again on its, why it did this maneuver, I don't know, but every single time it did it. It's like it came down in this attitude, and then it flipped over, and then entered the water. Uh, and the water just appeared to open up in front of it. It's just like the, the account in the, in the Bible about the parting of the Red Sea. That's exactly what happened. The sea actually parted, and this thing went into the water, and it closed up behind it. And this big spray went up into the air. But it wasn't a spray from the craft hitting the water. It was a spray from the water coming back in to fill up this hole that had been created. And uh, again, you know, I'm thinking, this, this is incredible. This, what are we looking at here? And it was metal. It was a machine. And, and uh, it wasn't glowing or anything like that. It didn't have any lights on it that we could see. Um, but it was obviously metal. And it was obviously a machine. And uh, although I can't tell you that there was anyone inside of it, I believe that there was. Um, and it did something that, that, as far as I knew, was absolutely impossible. I'd been in the Air Force, I'd worked on the state of the art of our, of our uh, aviation capabilities, and here I was on the deck of a submarine in the conning tower, and I knew what we had to be able to have to go underwater. And I knew that the two were incompatible. Here's something that came from under the water and flew in the air and performed maneuvers and then came back down and interfaced with the water at tremendous speed uh, and remained intact, uh, which realistically, it, it, it never touched the water. The water sort of magically opened up in front of it, but something had to interface with that water. Anything that we had that interfaced with the water in that manner would have been disintegrated. It's like hitting a brick wall. So I was looking at a technology that as far as our laws of physics and what we knew at that time didn't exist. This was in 1966. Uh, and Ensign um, Ball was uh, as shocked as I was. He called the captain to the bridge. He came up with the chief quartermaster who brought a camera. And uh, we all stood there and watched this occur over and over again for about 10 minutes. And I still to this day don't know if it was the same craft or a whole bunch of different craft going in and out of the water. 
but it seemed like that there was a hell of a lot of traffic on that freeway right there. <laughs> and we were watching it as we went by. We never changed course. We never lowered or, or increased our speed. Uh, we made no attempt to communicate or signal. Uh, we made no attempt to get closer. Um, and eventually, uh, it just stopped. We were told not to discuss it with anyone, not even amongst ourselves, which was incredible. I never had been told anything like that in my life. You know, you can't talk about something. And to be told that we couldn't even talk about it amongst ourselves was even more extraordinary, I thought. Um, but we didn't. We didn't talk about it. When we got to uh, Pearl Harbor, oh, all, all the time the chief quartermaster was taking pictures of this. So I know photographs were made. Uh, what happened to those photographs, I have no idea. But when we reached Pearl Harbor, we were not allowed to go ashore to um, to uh, go on liberty, even though we didn't have the duty. And uh, about two hours after we berthed uh, at the submarine base, a commander from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and uh, debriefed each one of us individually in the captain's stateroom. And the... Uh, the ultimate outcome of the debriefing was that uh, we didn't see anything, we didn't hear anything, and we had to read rules and regulations uh, that told us that if we ever talked about what it was that we didn't see, um, that we could uh, be imprisoned, uh, we could be fined uh, $10,000, we could lose all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. And I learned at that moment that the United States Navy didn't want anybody to know um, about what we saw and that uh, severe consequences could come down around the neck of anybody who did. And that was when I understood fully that, uh, yeah, there's a real cover-up. These things do exist, number one, uh, and uh, at least the United States Navy doesn't want anybody to know about it. And there's stiff penalties for anybody who bucks that. Hey there, Shep. Yeah, first it was that upside-down pyramid flying over a Navy destroyer back in 2019. Now we have new video taken from the same month around the same area, but this time it was something flying near one of the Navy's stealth ships when it suddenly plunged into the water and disappeared. Whoa, it's getting close. On a pitch black night off the coast of California, newly leaked video allegedly shows one of the U.S. Navy's stealth ships tracking an unknown object in the sky. And after a few minutes, splashed. splashed. Mark bearing range. The 2019 footage obtained by filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, who last month released another video of an upside down pyramid UFO hovering above a Navy destroyer. Now, you people out there have been ignoring the UFO phenomenon for too long. It has all the earmarks of the most successful, most sophisticated mind control operation in the history of the world and you are ignoring it. What better way to implement a plan to bring about a one world government than to create, create the possibility in the minds of the people of the world that we are being threatened from some other species, from some other planet, and do it in a way that if anybody questions it, or challenged it, or wants to talk about it publicly, that they are ridiculed. And the ultimate goal is to make the earth look very small, to present the people of the world with an external threat to this earth, a superior race from some other planet, vastly superior to us in intellect, philosophy, and technology, in order to cause the dissolution of nation states, the dissolution of all existing religions, and the formation of the world totalitarian socialist government. This is being promulgated in many ways, by television commercials, in the movies, in the newspapers, by creating incidents either real or imagined, 
I believe, because of my research, because of the extensive documentation that I've found and that is in my book, that this whole scenario has been created to give us an artificial alien threat from outer space.